if you've eaten your regular taco, you are connected to bats already. If you had your coffee already or your tea, you are connected to bats. If you're wearing any cotton, you are connected to bats. Our natural world inspires and shapes us, so it's more critical than ever that we work to protect it. I'm Alex Honnold, professional rock climber and founder of the Honnold Foundation, and this is Planet Visionaries, a podcast in partnership with Rolex's Perpetual Plan Initiative and the Washington Post Creative Group. Rolex and its Perpetual Plan Initiative support explorers, innovators, and visionaries who strive to protect our natural world. I'm proud to be bringing you some of their stories from the cutting edge of conservation. On this episode, I'll be speaking with Rodrigo Medellin, a conservationist championing bats around the world. Rodrigo, great to talk to you today. Hi, Alex. It's very good to talk to you today. Can you tell me where you're from and what you do? It so happens that I've been doing exactly what I want since the age of 12. I'm a professor of ecology at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Most of my work has to do with mammals that are endangered in terms of their conservation needs, in terms of what they do in uh, in the ecosystem that benefits us day in and day out. And then I just convey that information to the general public and to the decision makers so that we really realize how absolutely fascinating and important all of these animals are for our everyday lives. You say you've been doing what you love since age 12. How did you discover this love of, of animals? Ever since I remember, my the love of my life has been animals. And my first word was not mama or dada. My first word was flamingo. And then from <laughs> there, I would want to go to the zoo, go to the field, go to the forest, or get animal books. That continued throughout my life until I was 11 years old. And then there was this TV contest in national TV in Mexico called the 64,000 peso contest in which you choose a topic and they ask questions about that topic to you. And every time you answer correctly, you double the amount of pesos that you get until 64,000. So bless her heart, my mom took me to the producers of the show. I wanted to take the topic of mammals and they started asking questions and questions and I started responding and responding. And pretty soon they said, well, congratulations, you're the first kid in the show. So I started appearing every Saturday, prime time, 7 p.m. Everyone is watching, including the founder of the study of mammals in Mexico, Dr. Bernardo Villa, who saw me. He said, whoa, I need to talk to this kid. He called me home and he said, well, listen, I see that you're really interested in mammals. How about coming to the university and we will show you the animals that you like for real in the field? So that was a dream come true for an 11-year-old. So I started going out there. And when I was 12 is when my first bat came into my hands that sealed my fate. I never looked back. I'm still that 12-year-old. When I have a bat in my hand, I remain that 12-year-old. That is such a crazy story. And so when you say that at age 12, you held a bat for the first time and that really sealed the deal, why were you so interested in bats? When you are in the presence of bats, your whole universe and your whole image of bats changes completely. We have the wrong idea about bats. And that's exactly what happened to me. And then I started, you know, thinking that there's many animals in the world that have a very negative public image from snakes to sharks to spiders to scorpions to bats. None of those do more for our everyday well-being than bats. And still people treat them very badly. So so I said, I have to dedicate my life to redeem these poor animals that are being so unfairly treated by everyone in the world. Tell me a little bit about that, that, that benefit for humans. Number one is insect pest control. Three out of every four species of bats in the world, and we have more than 1,400 species of bats in the world, three out of every four feed on insects. For example, just in the northern fringe of Mexico, in the Mexico-U.S. border, we estimate that we have between 30 and 40 million bats of this one species, the Mexican free-tailed bat. 
each million bats destroys 10 tons of insects every night. So just imagine that for a second, we lose all of those millions of bats. You know, insects would just completely ravage all of our crops in a matter of weeks. We wouldn't have corn, we wouldn't have cotton, we wouldn't have rice, you know. So if you've, if you've eaten your regular taco, you are connected to bats already. If you had your coffee already or your tea, you are connected to bats. If you're wearing any cotton, you are connected to bats. So that's the first one. One is the uh, seed dispersal. And, you know, in tropical forests, the recovery of, of these forests is absolutely crucial for the future of the planet. Well, the main gardeners of forests are these bats that are dispersing between two and five seeds per square meter per night. And you can imagine with the millions of bats there, we really rely on them to do this. All we need to do is let the bats do their work and our, our forests will recover. That's for sure. And then the last one is pollination. And what can I say, Alex, as a Mexican, uh, you know, when, when you talk about Mexico and Mexican's legacy to the, to the world, one big element is tequila, tequila and mezcal. And yes, tequila comes from this plant, the agaves, that are pollinated by bats. And nobody knew that they were actually pollinated by bats and that without bats, we would lose tequila. What would I do without tequila in my <laughs> life? No way. <laughs> So each of the, the ecosystem services that you describe from bats, I think that the popular perception is all those things are done by, by birds or bees or basically the things that we see more in a day-to-day. -day. And it makes me think that so much of the, the, the challenge for bats is just that they're nocturnal and they're so small and they're so fast and that nobody sees any of the things that they're doing. Yes, but there's a lot of additional historical elements that come into play, Alex. For example, there was never a concept of a vampire, of a human being feeding on blood ever in the world until Bram Stoker wrote his incredible novel, Dracula. That is the moment in which really the public image of bats takes a nosedive. And from then on, bats have been considered uh, envoys of the devil, everything bad, diseases, bites, blood, eatings, etc., etc., etc. And it's really not their fault. They are fascinating evolutionary products that have become really the center of the uh, imagination for many people, but it's really not fair. Basically, you're saying that bats have a, have a branding issue. You know that it's all sort of marketing and PR. They need so, so I suppose you're the uh, you're the the marketing and PR department of of <laughs> the bat species. You could say that, yeah. It's funny as as a climber, my only interactions with bats are seeing them flutter around at night. Like last night, I, I I saw several bats going through my headlamp. But then the only other time I ever see bats is when you put your hand into cracks and uh, and they often roost in there. But it's really quite scary when they they. I don't know what species they are in Yosemite here, but they shriek at you in this terrible high-pitched shriek. And it's really <laughs> quite scary. You see these tiny little teeth and a tiny little face scrunched up, and then you hear this terrible <laughs> noise. And, uh, you know, when you're hanging on, you're like, oh, my God, it's it's pretty scary. Like, I, I, I got to say, I don't, I don't love, you know, I don't love bats. I find them slightly off-putting. <laughs> we have to talk about yeah. that, Alex. I mean, wouldn't you screech if all of a sudden you have a humongous finger coming into your van in the middle of the night and you're sleeping there with your family? You would screech. Of course you would screech. Rodrigo's childhood love for bats has turned into a remarkable career focused on saving them. So what do you do when you're doing research on bats and, and trying to educate the public about bats? When I go give a talk at a school or to lawmakers, you show them the bats feeding on the moths and showing the, the stems of the rice completely infested with larvae of the moths when the bats are not there. And they get it. They immediately get it. And then they turn into, OK, so what can we do to protect our bats? So that's one of the things that we do with the nectar feeding bats. What we've been able to do is documenting that uh, without the bats, 
Agave tequilana, the agave that is used for tequila, has lost 99% of its diversity because they do not allow a single plant to flower. So we started working with the tequila industry so that they allow 5% of the agaves to flower. And that allows the bats to bring genetic diversity back from the brink. And they are seeing very good benefits in recovering that agave genetic diversity. And the agaves are now a bit more resilient, resistant to diseases and to poor conditions and to climate change and so on. So that is just part of the research that I do. We deploy uh, radio transmitters with a little uh, flat-headed bat. So my students and I are scrambling through the bush and we find another one and another one and another one. So it looks like the bat is in better shape than we thought originally, but we still need to have a very strong conservation program in place, which is what we're doing right now. That's amazing. So what are the biggest challenges with this type of work? The main and foremost challenge is the the public image of bats. So what we need to do is to expand our influence in, in media and in social media. And, you know, things like this podcast that we're doing, Alex, is really reaching out to a lot of people. And I assure you, a lot of them will never have heard before that bats were so beneficial to us. So all we can do is hope that these kinds of things, this uh, podcast and news pieces and documentaries and so on, Take people like you, Alex. I know that after this conversation, Alex Honnold is going to be a champion for bats. It's, it's funny you say that, that I'm going to become a champion for bats, because that's kind of the case. Every time I interview somebody, I'm like, wow, you wouldn't <laughs> believe the craziest thing I learned. I mean, I suppose that's that's the fun of learning new things, is that Absolutely. then, you know, once, once you learn something, then you feel obligated to share it, because you're like, you wouldn't believe this incredible thing I learned. Exactly. Can you talk about some of the, the impacts that research has had? In 1994, the first ever minister of the environment in Mexico invited me to join her team as director general of wildlife. Some of the things that we were able to enact from those years is number one, protect a number of species of bats, a total of 34 species of bats that are now listed in the endangered species list of Mexico. And then I started a bunch of uh, recovery plans for those bats. I'm very happy to tell you, Alex, that the first mammal species to be delisted from the federal list of endangered species in Mexico is a bat. It's a tequila bat, as Sir David Attenborough calls him. But after 30 years of working with communities, this species became delisted in 2013. And uh, and then the U.S. followed suit. So that's a big battle that has been won. We've been able to declare several of the biggest caves in Mexico as sanctuaries. So they are protected by law. So that has been part of the contributions over the past 40 years that I've had. When you talk about the tequila bat being delisted from the endangered species list, how how satisfying is that? I mean, it's got to be amazing to think that, that due to your efforts, an endangered species is no longer endangered. Yeah, it, it, it does feel incredibly rewarding after years and years and years of trying to open the eyes of people about these bats and turning person by person, turning them into into bad defenders. So it's it feels very rewarding to finally say, okay, all of the indicators show that this species has recovered. It's time to tell it to the world. It's interesting to hear about a conservation battle actually being, you know, quote unquote, won. What are your thoughts on that kind of thing, you know, with, with conservation more broadly? It's late in my life. And uh, at this point in time, I cannot give up, Alex. I know that we have hope and that we can do things that are going to turn the trajectory that we are heading into, into a much brighter, sustainable future for humanity. I am fully convinced of that, and I'm fully determined to do everything I can to make it happen. Some of the things that I've been doing more recently, especially with some of the support by Rolex and others, is that we have put together a network called the Global South Bats Network. 
connecting and empowering and uniting people in Africa, Asia, Latin America, who are working on bats, who have never heard of each other, who have never learned from each other, and that may have really cool solutions for the problem that we've been cracking our heads against. And this is something that is urgently needed all over the world. We have a lot of lessons to learn from each other, but we never talk to each other. It is really high time that Africans, Asians, Latin Americans talk to each other directly. With support and recognition from international partners, Rodrigo has been able to scale his work across the globe. Can you talk about receiving the Rolex Awards for Enterprise in 2008 and how that launched you on this, on this conservation journey? Absolutely. I mean, that was a a game changer big time. Because of that, being in the center of the media attention catapulted me into an entirely new level of attention that then turned into people reaching out to me because they wanted to join forces with me. They wanted to support the project. They wanted to work with me. I have the strongest influence ever because of the Rolex Award and the awards that came after. I mean, I met David Attenborough and he made it so that we have this documentary, The Batman of Mexico, that won all kinds of awards and everything. I have to wonder how many people turn on The Batman of Mexico and were slightly disappointed that it was a documentary about bats and not, <laughs> you know, not the latest spinoff of the Batman franchise. I haven't gotten any any negative feedback from that. <laughs> Where's your cape, etc. So, So I don't think that's happened. But I mean, people people get reasonably surprised by the messages in the in the documentary. This is a, this is a dream come true, Alex. I am not here to prevent something bad from happening. I am here to make uh, the best possible future for humanity and for the planet. We have the possibilities, we have the knowledge, we have the technology, we have the information, we have the research to turn the next 20 years into a very positive, sustainable future. I am absolutely convinced about that. Yeah, that's a really powerful environmental message because I feel like that's that's something that much of the environmental movement is is missing right now, the positive dimension to it. Can you talk about what it what it feels like to be part of the the Rolex Awards community of laureates? I constantly work with with other laureates, and one of the most uh, rewarding things, and one of the uh, most joyful things that Rolex has ever done, is to to put us together. You know, learning from other people who have faced similar challenges and seeing. What they have achieved with a little bit of creativity here, a lot of willpower, a lot of influence in their local communities, it it really inspires you to become bigger than ever. I work with them and I, you know, I, I continue to learn more and more and more every time. One of the big lessons that I've learned is that we need to get out of our comfort zone. We're used to just working in our field sites and in our offices and in our classrooms and so on. And we never even set one toe out of that comfort zone. <clears throat> if we start By getting out of our comfort zone and start talking to the local people in your field sites or to the decision makers in your city, then you are going to feel awkward because you're out of your comfort zone for the first maybe two weeks, a month, two months. After two months, you will see that your comfort zone has grown. And once your comfort zone has grown and you're comfortable with that, that is the moment in which you have to get out of that comfort zone and make your comfort zone grow again and again and again and again. So in in effect, my universe has been expanded ever since I got my Rolex award because I've been learning how to work with my uncomfortable areas and turning, turning, turning them into comfortable areas. Yeah, that's interesting. And I also went through a very similar personal journey as what you're describing by being sort of thrust into the public eye through the through the film Free Solo and then yeah. suddenly having to, you know, 
adjust to that new <laughs> that new reality like like basically broadening your comfort zone you know like this is very scary and then you learn how to do a new thing and then you do it again and then you do it again and eventually you're actually quite comfortable doing things that you just couldn't even have imagined doing before exactly but but, it, but it's rare to hear people in other careers talk about that and and I think it's great to hear a scientist talking about extending your comfort zone into the world of policy and, and decision making and and, and real conservation. What do you hope to see with, with bat conservation? Well, I mean, one of the things that I've achieved over the past 20 years is to replicate myself, not only here in Mexico, but in many other countries. We have batmen in Costa Rica, in Malaysia, in many other countries, in Rwanda, in Kenya. We have many places that we're working together on the same page with the same kind of protocol, the same kind of studies documenting those ecosystem services and then helping them turn turn these into policy. Um, so I don't want to say that I've achieved my my goal, Alex, because that is absolutely not true. So what, what I envision as a bright future for BATS is number one, that everyone in the world recognizes and appreciates and values all of the benefits that we get from our everyday life, no matter if you're an Inuit or, or if you're an Amazonian Indian, you are benefited by bats. It doesn't matter where you are. Are there bats in the, in the polar regions? There's one species that comes into the North Pole, yes. <laughs> one. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. I feel like in some ways your career is an example of, of you having achieved a lot of your goals absolutely and then redrawn your goal lines is it fair to say that you've done far more than you ever would have imagined as as a child what i can tell you alex is that expectations that i had in my life have been exceeded and i have a lot more influence than i ever possibly uh, would would have been able to expect from a life of a scientist in a uh, university in Mexico City. You go through this as well, Alex, in your uh, rock climbing uh, profession. You constantly shift the premises of your future and you change what you're going to achieve in the next five years or in the next 10 years. This is happening to me all the time. And, and even at this stage in my life, and I'm 65 years old right now, uh, I am, I have absolutely no plans of slowing down or, or retiring or nothing. I'm going to continue pushing for as far as I can go. I'm glad to hear it because, you know, you're, <laughs> you're, you're doing so much. For Rodrigo, the future of conservation relies on all of us expanding our comfort zone. What do you hope for the the next generation doing your work? You know, like the people who are taking up your mantle and, and carrying on these conservation efforts. One of them is that they have to see that they have to reinvent themselves every so often so that they adjust and adapt to the new conditions. The new generations, they have to be very savvy, very knowledgeable in social sciences and political sciences and even ethical issues and religion and all these things that we used to not take into account when you were saving a species 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Now they play a role. And what advice would you give the average person, you know, non-conservation, non-biologists on how they can help keep the planet perpetual? After listening to this podcast and after learning through the media, documentaries, you name it, etc., you know that the only thing that is not allowed is to continue living your life the way you've been living it for the past 10 or 15 years. Once you start with that first change, then you make another and then another and then another, and then another, and you keep pushing changes in your life. Everyone can make tiny little changes. Find out where your water is coming from. Find out how your food is being produced. And we many times don't really connect the two, you know. Everyone can make tiny little changes. And the thing is to continue making these changes. That I'm fully convinced it's happening. We, we have to make it faster, yes, but we are empowering the new generations into making those changes. Yeah, I think that's totally in line with what you're saying about expanding your comfort zone. 
with like constantly taking on slightly broader challenges. Because I feel like with with individual conservation of or sort of individual environmental efforts like that, it's it's the same idea of your comfort zone where you do the thing that's that's easy to start and then you build up from there. Like as as you learn how to make changes, you just make bigger and bigger changes. Then change becomes your comfort zone. Exactly. That was bat conservationist Rodrigo Medellin. I'm Alex Honnold. Thanks for listening to Season 3 of Planet Visionaries. We'll be back next season with even more inspiring individuals at the forefront of climate solutions. Until then, be sure to check out the next generation of environmental innovators at rolex.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment to help others find the podcast. 